So where did you first meet Nassim? Was it in, in uh, California or was it in Hawaii? Uh, yeah, well, um, I was doing my research in San Jose, California on uh, unusual motors and generators, that sort of thing, and Nassim showed up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I went to see one of his talks, and uh, we just kind of hit it off right away, and he was... Uh, sort of running around in a van and quite honestly doing rather poorly financially and I suggested to him, me and a number of friends, that he meet up with a guy by the name of Foster Gamble uh, and that they might hit it off and, and actually make some progress together. So now, how did the name Foster Gamble uh, happen on to you, that you would give that to Nassim? Well, again, I had mutual friends, uh, Randy Masters, a number of mutual friends and we were all quite familiar with Foster who lived in the area. Uh, and and we knew that he had interests in in these things, and so uh, Foster had a lot of interest in geometries and was studying atoms and so forth and so on. And Nassim probably had some of the most provocative ideas in that area, uh, as far as how Nassim had been putting together the bits and pieces that he had learned from Walter Russell and just so many different people. However, the angle I had with Tesla and Keeley and more of the energy people was was these were areas that Nassim was uh, hadn't quite put together yet. Gotcha. Well, yeah, and, and you know, th and that's the area that I want to discuss next. You also gave me a copy of your book, Free Energy One Hundred and One: A History Making Revolutionary Breakthrough Story, a Communication, a Briefing. Uh, can you share with the listeners uh, a little bit about the cutting edge free energy revelations that you share in this book? Um, yes, and th this is an area that I hope people really pay attention to. Uh, you know, there's so many different ways to tell that story. Uh, those who are real technical out there, those that have their fingers in the thick and heavy of this pie are familiar with Tesla, Keeley. Uh, they're familiar with terms like radiant energy or radiant matter and so forth and so on. Um, you know, as I rambled around the many years, I... I you know, had had yet to meet anyone that was running their homes on a so-called free energy device. So uh, a gentleman came uh, to my knowledge uh, that, that he was actually doing that. He was running his home on free energy, and of course, I wanted to meet him. And when we say free energy, again, people, I'm, I'm, you people who are listening, all the listeners, I'm talking about things that have a COP greater than one. They put out more energy than than you put into them. So I have a question, Jerry. Was was this now this gentleman? Uh, you don't have to mention his name uh, if you don't want to. With, well, in I the book, I do. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to go on that in a little bit. But my question is: the unit that this man had invented was it a, a self-contained unit, for example, like a package air conditioning unit that's outside of the home, or exactly? Can you explain a little bit about what exactly he invented? Um, yeah, well, again, that's kind of why I wrote the book. You know, you're kind of getting into the topic of why I wrote the book in the first place. And when I, when I met this uh, fellow who had been a student of Keeley and Tesla, as, as anyone might imagine, those are the kind of people you want to study to uh, study the masters, as it were. Um, the devices were sort of air conditioning size units that uh, some of them had moving parts, some of them didn't. And to be clear, there were a variety of devices, and uh, they kind of tipped the scales on our normal engineering and science thinking because uh, they ran in, in, a, in a manner that, of course, our science says that they cannot. And, and so there, therein lies the twist to the story is, uh, you know, at that time, 2000, 2001, 3, people were still extremely skeptical and negative about the, the possibility of a device that could produce more energy than it consumes. So this group, this individual um, who had these devices actually running their homes, heating their homes, uh, you know, th this just sounded unbelievable. And, and of course, they invited me out and I got to actually see these things running. Now, as a scientist, when you saw these things, I mean, uh, it defied conventional uh, electricity, did it not? Yes, and can I chat a little bit about that concept of conventional electricity to try to help people understand something here? Absolutely. Yeah, this, this is the gray area for most people. Um, there's been this in-the-box thinking that basically electricity is one flavor. In other words, 
you know, there's this teaching in the schools, et cetera, et cetera, that we have these electrons and they're negative and they just go from positive to negative or they're repelled by negative. You know, there's a real basic, basic uh, concept of what electricity is, uh, that it's just this, this simple sort of electron thing, positive thing, and that's that. And what uh, you begin to realize as you, you learn the real truth behind electricity is it is many flavors, just like ice cream, uh, Stephen. Ice cream comes in chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, and, you know, the list is endless. You know, yes, it's all ice cream, uh, but the idea that electricity can have many, many flavors, many twists, many turns, that that, uh, that kind of might seem a little baffling to people that, that in fact, that, that electricity is not all the same kind of uh, stuff. And so when, when, and that is one of the key points I try to get out in my book of the breakthrough disclosures, the breakthrough understandings that, you know, to get people out of this box that electricity is this simple little thing called electrons and, you know, pluses and minuses. Well, you're exactly right, because I know in, in the early days of electricity, you had Edison who was promoting direct current, and then you had Tesla and some of the other uh, inventors talking about alternate current, and Edison went as far as to, uh, to kill an elephant, alternate current to kill an elephant to show that... Uh, Alternating current was not the way to go, that they should stick with his invention of direct current for the future, which I thought was like, wow, so you kill a, uh, an elephant to prove this? And ultimately, it turned out that Tesla's technology prevailed because we now use and enjoy alternate current. Correct. Well, the bombshell in the book, um, Steve, Stephen, is that there's a type of energy called dominant, and this is just something that is just as mysterious. It's exotic. It's an exotic term. Uh, you could talk to an MIT uh, graduate. You could talk to a Stanford graduate, and you would ask him, what is dominant electricity or dominant energy? And quite honestly, you would be hit by the most baffled look you would ever experience on the face of a highly educated technical person who simply knows absolutely nothing about it. Well, I know you mentioned in Chapter 4 of your book, Strange and Exotic Materials, and I, I guess that's where you preface uh, this information there. I was really intrigued by your book, uh, reading it, and I've read it a number of times, and the fact that I know you and, and, and I've had the privilege of working with you, doing a number of shows with you, uh, breaking bread with you, going up to the mountain together, and uh, having that machine, I know for a fact when people talk to me about free, free energy or, or that type of technology, I have to say to them, I beg to differ. I know that it exists. It's, it's like, you know, something that I've seen before. I've had my hands on certain things. I've been able to touch it and benefit from it. So it's hard for me to be a, a naysayer when I actually have had the benefit. I recently watched a movie that was released by Forster Gamble, and we were talking about him earlier. And in the movie, he was interviewing the Sim. And the sim was saying the same things that you had been saying. And so that Thrive movie to me was like a tie-in. How does that movie completely tie in with your work with the sim and Foster? And because I felt like there was, they opened the door, these nuances, but I just felt that I wanted more. Can you kind of elaborate on what they didn't give us in that Thrive movie? Absolutely. Taking bits and pieces, well, you know, I mean, I was the third cog in the wheel. Um, there was a partnership between Foster, Nassim, and I, and we were the three partners who had agreed to work together to bring about this new energy paradigm. Me being way ahead of both of those guys when we met in 99, 1999, and formed our group, that did research in Santa Cruz, California for a couple of years, much of it funded and helped along by Foster himself, who, as he says in the movie, there are bits and pieces in that movie that he tells the audience, and I'll, I'll, I'll just chime into a little bit of that, where Foster says, you know, even he had doubts and skepticism about the free energy, and he said in there that when he first heard about it, he simply didn't believe it, and, and he's very clear about that, and he, it took him a while much to my consternation and much to my dismay for him to come around and get up to the same speed that I was, uh, which is that, that the free energy is real, of course. And, you know, I just didn't think it would take long for smart, intelligent, and educated people to realize that. And, and there was my 
a lack of estimation of how long it would take people to get this. You know, the fact that it took Foster 10 years to to get it where I had gotten it 20, 30 years ago, you know, that, that was, you know, much to my lack of support there. But the idea was we formed a partnership and, and I was the key technical contributor who was, you know, there to make it happen. And of course we did in fact have some breakthroughs in, in uh, energy devices there that were very promising. It sounds like something happened at that point. Was the, was the plug pulled? Where did somebody get cold feet? Or why did this not continue? Well, um, this opens a Pandora's box to what happens when you form partnerships with people. You know, on the surface, I think a lot of people really have a lot of respect and appreciation for Nassim and also on the surface, you know, and Foster's a marvelous person, of course. There, there was some internal quibbling between Nassim and I. You know, there, there were some, some problems there, some personal problems that led to uh, difficulties in all of us being able to continue to work together. Well, you know what, what I find in, uh, being around people, that ego, you know, as much as people don't want to admit that they have one, a number of people have very large ones. They, they enjoy more listening to themselves speak than hearing their collaborative partners who want to share information with them. And that very well might be the case uh, in, in this endeavor that you had. Well, again, you know, after I sort of made the breakthrough, which, uh, you know, should I talk a little bit about that because it really is important? Absolutely. I'd like you to you speak your mind today. Well, again, you know, Foster, you know, put time and money into us, and, and I really appreciate everything he did for us uh, now because of his Thrive movie where everybody feels that he's really proactive uh, towards his free energy and stuff, you know. What, what I tell people is, you know, you can be proactive, you can support it verbally, but, you know, without the money on the table from folks, without the actual solid support, um, basically nothing's going to get done. But, you know, what we did get done, in other words, what he did get to see for his money was I was uh, developing a motor generator combination device. And what happened one day is I was trying out a variety of things. I did something that uh, in science and engineering is not supposed to happen. And what that was, was I had a motor, you know, that um, of my own design. And in, in electrical engineering, when you short out your generator, this is the worst thing you can do. This is known to be an absolute no-no. Okay, are you following me on that, Steve? Absolutely. I, I have a little electrical background in HVAC, so I follow you very closely, Jerry. So I can assure the listeners out there that if you go home or any of you go out to your garage or any of you take wire and cut the wire and short the two wires together and then plug it into your wall, I can assure all of you that this would be a very bad thing to do. This is called a short when you take two hot wires and stick them together. And everybody knows you simply do not do that because that's when you blow your circuit breakers in your house. That's when you burn up your generator. And, you know, once again, I, I'm going over this carefully to understand, get people to understand something because a lot of people lack a science background. And when we, energy inventors, tell them or show them something, they don't even realize why it's different or why it's important or why it's significant. So with that background and with that said, that, that it's well known in electrical art and skill that you do not short the generator coil. What I did there one day is I did the unthinkable. I took my generator coil on my motor and I shorted it. And that's when unbelievable things or strange things began to happen, is that correct? Well. What is supposed to happen is it's called a load on the motor and the motor slows down and everybody knows this. Well, on that day that I shorted that generator coil. So now the motor... The motor sped up. Can you share with the listeners uh, a little bit about the cutting edge free energy revelations that you share in this book? Um, yes, and th this is an area that I hope people really pay attention to. Uh, you know, there's so many different ways to tell that story. Uh, those who are real technical out there, those that have their fingers in the thick and heavy of this pie are familiar with Tesla, Keeley, uh, their fight away. And he was uh, sort of running around in a van and quite honestly doing rather poorly financially. And I suggested to him, me and a number of friends, that he meet up with a guy by the name of Foster Gamble uh, and that they might hit it off and, and actually make some progress together. So now, how did the name Forster Gamble uh, happen on to you, that you would give that to Nassim? 
well, again, I had mutual friends. Uh, So where did you first meet Nassim? Was it in, in uh, California or was it in Hawaii? Uh, yeah, well, um, I was doing my research in San Jose, California on uh, unusual motors and generators, that sort of thing, and Nassim showed up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I went to see one of his talks, and uh, we just kind of hit it off. Uh, Randy Masters, a number of mutual friends, and we were all quite familiar with Foster who lived in the area. Uh, and and we knew that he had interests in in these things, and so uh, Foster had a lot of interest in geometries and was studying atoms and so forth and so on. And Nassim probably had some of the most provocative ideas in that area uh, as far as how Nassim had been putting together the bits and pieces that he had learned from Walter Russell and just so many different people. However, the angle I had with Tesla and Keeley and more of the energy people was was these were areas that Nassim was uh, hadn't quite put together yet. Gotcha. Well, yeah, and you know, th and that's the area that I want to discuss next. You also gave me a copy of your book, Free Energy One Hundred and One: A History-Making Revolutionary Breakthrough Story, a Communication, a Briefing. Uh, can 